uh, Greg Braille from Effigy. Um, we've talked a lot about APIs. I really, I, I got into this late and I kind of read the assignment and I'm going to talk about really the technology aspects of some of this stuff. And when I thought about optimizing APIs for many devices, what I really thought about was optimizing APIs for devices. Um, it's interesting that uh, Daniel talked about how they're customizing APIs at Netflix for a lot of different devices. And I want to talk a little bit about the pros and cons because sometimes, yes, you do have to do that. And sometimes, depending on your audience, you know, that's like a secondary concern. So first I wanted to talk about some of the problems. Those of you who are building apps for mobile devices, especially, and when I say devices, I think of not computers. Uh, I think of iPads and iPhones and all that great stuff. Um, these are problems you guys are familiar with. Devices are slow. Compared to even a halfway decent laptop these days, a really good phone is still slow. So some of the things that people who have come from internal development worlds have learned, uh, things that they don't worry about when they're building an app for consumption by a server or something that runs on the corporate network, become big problems when we get onto the internet, <coughs> when we get onto the mobile network, and when we get to the mobile devices, like the speed of the CPU. Or the speed of the network. Yeah, LTE is theoretically very fast if you're standing still. Um, 3G is theoretically pretty fast if you're standing still and not on the train or the airplane or, or driving your car. So, you know, you have all certainly noticed this effect. I don't need to tell anyone who has a smartphone that uh, the network is not as fast as it, as it is in theory or as fast as the network in your office or at home on your cable modem. Programmers are in a hurry. I've heard some people say that programmers are lazy, programmers are dumb. Programmers aren't lazy and dumb. Programmers are in a hurry. I do plenty of programming and, you know, I've been struggling, for instance, recently uh, with an API from a big company that does database functionality. But it's not really SQL and it's a REST API, but it's a little funky. Boy, it would be nice if I could just and have it working and not have to think too much about it. All programmers are like that. Um, you go to a room full of enterprise programmers and say, yeah, you know, download the WSDL and compile the SOAP and read the XML. And they'll say, great. You go to your uh, partner who's developing the mobile app for your iPhone for you and you're, you say the same thing and they'll say, the what? The WSDL? The XML? SAML? What's SAML? They want to hear about JSON. They want to hear about OAuth sometimes. Sometimes they strangle you if you say that. They want to hear about REST, but they, then they a four-hour debate engages about what it means when you use the letters REST together, and that's probably out of scope for today's presentation. So we want to keep that stuff simple. Other problems developers see are public APIs tend to be pretty inconsistent. Uh, the Twitter API is infamous. They've actually have made great bounds in their operations. You're not seeing headlines about Twitter being down like you used to. But, you know, getting my timeline yesterday took a second. A second is a long time for an API call. Sometimes it takes multiple seconds. That's a pretty long time. Private APIs are even slower. And this is something we encounter all the time at Apogee. We work all the time with companies who have internal systems and they want to expose APIs. Sometimes they want to expose them to the public. Sometimes they want to expose them privately, like Daniel does. In many, many cases, these are built on existing enterprise systems. Existing enterprise systems were designed to be accessed by people sitting on desktop applications inside the company, servers inside the company over fast networks. In very few cases were they designed to be accessed by 50,000 mobile devices running over slow networks or 50,000 of anything. So, and we've even been working with some companies recently to launch some mobile APIs who have newer back-end systems. And even then, once you throw in a database and an app server and a couple different layers of technology, or in older, more mature industries, five, six, seven layers of technology between the API and what is actually the data that the API is serving up. We've, you know, 500 milliseconds is sometimes a good response time. We've seen APIs that take 30 seconds to respond. And it's awfully hard for a mobile developer to build a usable app if when they open up the app and it tries to load the home screen, if one API call takes 30 seconds, and if, as Daniel described, some of the APIs, sometimes you make five or six, uh, now, you're in, now you're in a lot of trouble. Other thing, most APIs talk too much. Even new public APIs designed in the age of the Internet using JSON. My, uh, my uh, Twitter public timeline is 45K in JSON, and it's 64K in XML. And uh, we all talked about using JSON because it's more compact. Well, yeah, it's more compact. Um, most of the data in there, if you've ever used curl or the 
I'll put in one quick plug, the Apogee API console for Twitter, to look at the content of a Twitter API call, you'll see that for your most mobile apps, you don't need most of what's in there. That's not just the case for Twitter, that's the case for an awful lot of APIs. Again, a lot of time the database structure was designed for use by internal systems, or the API was designed to include all the information anybody might want to use, whether they're building a complicated business-to-business -business app, or whether they're building the simplest app for the iPhone. Well, that becomes a, you know, a little bit of a problem now, um, and again, compound the things we said before, devices are slow, networks are slow, programmers are lazy, and now you're not developing an app with a good user experience. Now you're wasting a lot of your users' time, and you're struggling and you're fighting, and we've all had the experience of launching an app on the iPad, for instance, and I can name one news organization who's had some trouble with that, and just, you know, after a few seconds you don't want to use it anymore. And that's, you know, time is money in this business, and I think you all know that better than I do. So, app developers, none of this is good for you. For the API team who's providing the API, if that's the side you're on, can you make this friendlier for your developers? Whether your developers are public developers who you don't know, or people in the, in the company, either you've got to make it friendlier for their developers, or the developers are going to take it into their own hands and do something about it. Uh, Daniel described how they're doing a lot of customization at Netflix. That's because they work with a lot of device providers who have specific requirements. We have other customers like this. One device provider will say, yeah, love your API, but you know, it's a multi-million dollar contract and uh, you're going to make it look like this. You know, vendor number two says that, vendor number three says that, vendor number 50 says that. All of a sudden you need some sort of layer where you can customize those API responses. So I'll go quick about these tools in your arsenal. Data transformation and, and caching. Yes, JSON is simpler for most developers and they smile when you give it to them. Most developers nowadays, when you give them XML, they either scratch their heads or they prepare to dive into XML parsing. Um, some of the things, some of the best practices we've seen out there in both public and private APIs, you can have parameters on the API that say, you know, give me the smaller version or give me the bigger version. Google has a very clever thing they've put in their APIs called a partial response. It's just one parameter that says these are the parts of the API response that I want. That allows the mobile developers to choose on their own how much of the API response they actually want to get back, rather than having them to do some sort of, you know, manipulation. Also, you know, be ruthless. You can always have more than one API. You can always have different API calls with parameters, one that returns everything and one that doesn't. Compression. I'll be really quick on this. My infamous 45K JSON Twitter timeline compresses down to 6K using the compression feature that's been built into the HTTP protocol since forever and is supported by nearly all clients. For some reason, a lot of servers don't turn compression on. They don't support compression. Why not? You're dealing with mobile devices. The difference between getting 6K over the network and getting 45K over a slow mobile network I'd actually love to do the math on that, and I think next time we present this, I will. I think that uh, it's going to have a real effect on your user experience and on the bill you pay for bandwidth, by the way, to your hosting provider if you're the people hosting the API. Caching. I mentioned the 30-second API call. That's a, a customer we worked with a while back. We've seen some recently. You know, maybe the back end can handle a couple hundred transactions a second, which is good if you can produce a system that does that but maybe uh, you actually need to handle eight or nine or 10,000 transactions a second. We're working with a customer like that right now. Um, caching can be the answer to that. If the, if the API data, and you have already have caching. You have caching in your CPU, you have caching on your disk, you have caching hopefully in front of your database, you may have caching in your app server. The great thing about APIs is that you can put things in between. You know, we've got you know, two companies here on the stage who sell something in between. There are also a number of open source solutions for caching. Caching completed API responses is great because you don't have to change the server. You don't have to change the client. But now you've reduced all of the response time of your whole backend infrastructure. You can cut seconds or tens of seconds out of the response time for an API call through caching. Obviously, caching can not just be local. Um, CDNs are great. Um, you can put API proxies in a lot of geographical locations. Amazon is great for this. You can also actually use a CDN. 
the Netflix API, and we've talked about the API, but at the end of the day, the API returns you a link to a video, because that's why you're using the API, is because you want to watch something. That's in a CDN, you know. No brainer there, but it, it always is worth mentioning. So that's, that's the quick and dirty, you know, technical version of this. But, you know, the point I wanted to make was, you know, by, by designing your API with the needs of developers in mind, if your developers are open developers and you don't know them, or whether they're private developers and you do, you actually have the opportunity to make the whole experience for the user of the app a lot more effective. And uh, that's my 10 minutes, so thank you.